Okay, good afternoon. And, uh, yesterday we celebrate, well, you don't celebrate Memorial Day, you remember Memorial Day. Uh, and I'm still doing a few talks left over from World War I through what used to be Declaration Day, which used to be May 30th, but there is no Declaration Day anymore. It's the Memorial Day weekend. But uh, we're going back to 1917. And sometimes when I do these talks, like 1917, 1916, 1915, it's like I've been transported back in time and we're facing the same issues that we faced 107 years ago. Uh, America enters the Great War uh, back in 1917. And uh, there's the Espionage Act, let's, tramp, let's trample on uh, freedom of speech, Woodrow Wilson. Wilson's against women's suffrage. Wilson does not want women to vote. New York City, there's a protest of lynching in 1917. Imagine that, lynching, a protest down Fifth Avenue. Uh, the Birth of the Nation, or Birth of a Nation, that's the D.W. Griffith film that came out in uh, 1915, 1916, and that leads to the creation of the Ku Klux Klan. And the Immigration Act in 1917, where basically the Statue of Liberty says, go home, we don't want you here. Uh, Puerto Ricans become US citizens in 1917, and of course, today we talk about whether or not Puerto Rico should become a state, the United States picks up the Danish Virgin Islands and renames them the Virgin Islands of the United States. Prohibition gains traction. And this bar is in Boston, and it's a place called Cary Nation. And Cary Nation was one of the leaders of the uh, anti-liquor movement, the Prohibition movement, and she has a bar named after her up in Boston. The oldest speakeasy in Boston was Cary Nation. There was the Russian Revolution, where there were two revolutions actually in 1917, and I don't know how many of you got, uh, how many of you know of the name Arthur James Balfour. Balfour Declaration. Balfour Declaration. And what was that all about? He promised that he didn't promise. He said that the Jews should have a homeland in Palestine. There wasn't a promise made. It was just a suggestion. And the uh, National Hockey League uh, started in 1917. I don't know how many of you know anything about hockey, but he was one of the greatest hockey players ever, Gordie Howe. And I got to skate with him in the charity game. But uh, we start 1914, and we start with this guy. That is the Archduke Ferdinand. And uh, Ferdinand is, um, well, he's assassinated uh, in 1914. Uh, there are a series of uh, Austrian-Hungarian leaders who get assassinated. Maximilian III was sent to Mexico to rule over Mexico. He's going to be the emperor of Mexico, according to Napoleon III. And uh, the Mexicans got rid of him around 1867. Uh, so he's going to Sarajevo. Say the birth of a nation. Yeah. Led to the revival of the Ku Klux Klan. Yeah. Well, we'll explain that. We'll get to it. Oh, okay. We will get to it. Anyway, uh, Ferdinand, uh, uh, rather, Franz Ferdinand was the heir to the throne of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and he and his wife were assassinated by gunmen during a drive through Sarajevo. That's on January 28, 1914. <laughs> now, he ignored warnings that a group called the Black Hand Serbian terrorists were looking to gun him down. Uh, and they were upset because they were annexed. Serbia was annexed by uh, Austria back in 1908. So they put out word, we're going to get them. And uh, he decides, well, I'm going to go to Sarajevo during Serbian National Day, June 28th. So I said, listen, front, that's not good. I We could go to Sarajevo, Sarajevo some other time. I hear it's really nice in the winter. They may have an Olympics in the winter one day, so it's got to be really nice in the winter. Uh, Sophie is saying, we can't go. Don't go, don't go. Fran said, why shouldn't we go? Let's go. And they get assassinated, the two of them. And that was traced back to a Serbian extremist group that wanted to increase Serbian power in the Balkans. 
by breaking up the Austria-Hungarian Empire. World War I at that point is known as the Great War. Well, the Great War would start on July 28, 1914. Austria-Hungary declares war on Serbia. And the peace between all of Europeans' great powers falls apart. Within a week, Russia, Belgium, France, Great Britain, and Serbia are lined up against Austria-Hungary and Germany, and World War I, or the Great War, gets underway. Uh, the Austria-Hungary Empire attacks Serbia in response. Germany supported Austria-Hungary, while the Russians sided with Serbia. So everybody is picked apart there, and it's time to go to war. Except the Americans. That's the president, Woodrow Wilson. He's watching, and he decides, you know, this has really nothing to do with us. This is a European affair. Uh, we're not going to get involved. We're going to stay out of the war. It's strictly European. Uh, at the outbreak, the United States adopts a, pol a policy of neutrality, and, uh, but they're going to do trade with both sides. There will be commerce with both sides, trading with both sides, so the United States isn't going to lose a money flow. On August 4th, Wilson declared the United States would remain impartial in thought as well as action. But uh, things begin to change a little bit in 1915 with the sinking of the Lusitania uh, passenger ship off of the uh, Ireland coast. Uh, and uh, 1915, Germany declared the waters surrounding the British Isles to be a war zone, and German U-boats sunk several commercial and passenger vehicles including some U.S. ships. Widespread protest over the sinking by, of the U-boat, or by the U-boat, of the British Ocean Liner of Lusitania, which was going to Liverpool from New York. It was on the New York to Liverpool, Liverpool to New York route. Uh, turned the tide in terms of uh, American opinion because there were American passengers on board when the ship was sunk on May 7, 1915. Uh, and this ship, the SS Arabic, also a British ship, is torpedoed. That's on August 19, 1915, and uh, Germans said it was self-defense. Now, uh, I used to speak on cruise ships uh, before COVID-19. One of the lines I spoke on was Holland America. And one day we had an historian from Holland America discuss the history of Holland America and its war activities and its immigration activities. Holland America would take uh, people looking to flee Europe over to America as part of their regular business. And also, there used to be munitions on these ships. And Holland America did transport some uh, munitions back and forth. So the Germans, in a way, they had their reasons to sink passenger ships because they had felt or had known that some of the passenger ships did have munitions. Uh, the event further strained diplomatic relations between the United States and Germany. Wilson warned Germany that if it was determined the ship uh, was sunk without cause, the United States could, could cut off diplomatic relations with Germany and enter the war against Germany. So Germany backs down. In September 1950, they say, 15, they say, we're not going to sink any passenger ships without warning. Satisfied, at least for the moment, Wilson chose not to declare war on Germany, despite being encouraged otherwise by some of his cabinet members. And the guy who's running for president in 1916, guy who you probably know, Theodore Roosevelt. And he is pushing Wilson to declare war on Germany. Presidential election, 1916. Wilson runs on one campaign slogan. He kept us out of war. He kept us out of war. That is his entire platform. Uh, the United States presidential election of 1916 took place with the war going on in Europe. Public sentiment in the still neutral United States lean to the British and the French. They were the Allied forces due to the harsh treatment of civilians by the German army which invaded and occupied large parts of, Ger of Belgium and northern France. By the way, take a look at Woodrow Wilson's opponent. What do you know this about him, Charles Ever Evan Hughes? What do you know this about uh, Charles Evan Hughes, Evan Hughes, if you can see him? He's got a beard. He's got a beard. He's the only guy in the 20th century to run who had a beard. 
Teddy Roosevelt had a mustache. You have to go back to 1888 to find a presidential candidate with a beard, and that was Benjamin Harrison, and he ran again in 1892 and lost. He's the only guy who had whiskers in the 20th century, and so far in the 21st century, who's run for president who has had facial hair. Uh, the campaign pitted the incumbent Wilson, uh, the Democratic candidate, against the uh, Supreme Court Justice Charles Evans Hughes, uh, the Republican candidate. Uh, despite their sympathy with the Allied forces, most American voters wanted to avoid any kind of involvement in the war and preferred to continue a policy of neutrality. Wilson's campaign used slogans like, kept us out of war. How about this slogan, America, America first. Did you ever hear that one? Yes. America first? Yes. Yeah, and to appeal to those voters who wanted to avoid a war in Europe or with Mexico. Hughes criticized Wilson for not taking the necessary preparations to face a conflict. Wilson is also against women's right to vote. How many of you think women should be voting? <laughs> hey! Yeah. Yeah. He didn't. He didn't. He felt that women should not vote. Uh, he, but he authored the Democratic Platform in 1916. Uh, this is what we did during my first administration. We maintained neutrality. But he also refused to support the Congressional Amendment guaranteeing women the right to vote. Uh, there is uh, Hughes. Uh, he criticized Wilson's neutrality on the conflict in Europe, despite the fact that public sentiment was decidedly anti-war. The Republicans also harped on Wilson's failed effort to overthrow the military dictatorship in Mexico. Imagine that, the United States having problems with Mexico. Can you believe that? But it's been that way since about 1830. Uh, Hughes did endorse women's suffrage. Uh, Hughes campaigned actively, but was described. You know how, you ever watch presidential debates? You ever watch them? And, and these moderators, these moderators get up and they say, was that guy presidential? Did that guy look presidential? Or in Hillary's Clinton case, Hillary Clinton's case, did she look presidential during the debates? Why? Does it really matter what somebody looks like? Aren't you listening to what they say? But uh, even without radio and without TV, in 1916, uh, just newspapers and magazines and maybe some movie reels, uh, Hughes is described as wooden, and he fails to excite the American population uh, because of his personality. Wilson probably wins. California, Minnesota, sure, California is in debt. Well, you know who helped put them over the top in California? Women. Women had the right to vote in California, and he won California by 3,000 votes. Uh, Wilson prevailed. The election was most, much closer than anticipated. He got less than the majority, 49.4%, 277 electoral votes. Hughes got 46.2% of the popular vote, 254 electoral votes. It was the first election since 1892 that a Democrat won. That was Grover Cleveland. Grover Cleveland ran in 1884, won. Ran against Harrison, Benjamin Harrison in 1888, lost, and beat Harrison in the rematch in 1892. It was the first time since Andrew Jackson in 1832 when a Democrat was elected to consecutive terms. Wilson enters 1970 as the man whose campaign, campaign slogan was, he kept us out of war. Stalemate in Europe by this point. Uh, the war on the Western Front. Let me ask you a question. How many of you watched the uh, movie, All Quiet on the Western Front? Oh, yeah. 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 My father-in-law's favorite movie. For whatever reason, it was his favorite movie. Uh, the Western Front had become one of... Uh, uh, one of attrition as 1917 drew to a close, the French army was exhausted. Having borne the brunt of the Allied effort and the trauma of Verdun, uh, the British began suffering manpower shortages, having increasingly taken over from the French. The German army was weakened. Despite being able to concentrate entirely on the Western Front after the defeat of Russia, uh, its manpower rapidly diminishing in Austria. Hungary, uh, they are crumbling, or that country is crumbling. 
Um, I'm going to read you this Western Union telegram. It came from Germany, goes through Galveston, Texas to Mexico. I want to see if you can make heads or tails out of it. Uh, 130, 13042, 13401, 8501, 115. That's a code. That's a code. And the Germans were audacious enough to send a telegram to Mexico through Galveston, Texas with a code. Uh, it's called the Zimmerman Telegram. And in January, the British intelligence intercepted the telegram from German Foreign Minister Arthur Zimmerman to the German Minister of Mexico, or to Mexico, Heinrich von Eckhart. Uh, the Zimmerman telegram stated that Germany had planned to return to unrestricted submarine warfare and would sink all ships, including those carrying American passengers, located in a war zone. But the British decide, we are not sharing this with the Americans. Um, we have code breakers. We can't really tell the Americans what's going on, at least not yet. Uh, we don't know, we don't want the Germans to know that we broke their code. Uh, but Germany does resume unrestricted uh, submarine warfare in February, and the British said, okay, look, America, this is what they sent this telegram to Mexico, this is what they're doing. What are you going to do about it? Uh, that is Monterey, California. That was once part of Mexico, Monterey, California. It's absolutely gorgeous and beautiful there, right? Well, after the War of 1848, the United States took 55% of, of uh, Mexican land, including California and Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, and Oklahoma, uh, Colorado, Peace of Colorado. Uh, in Nevada, and uh, the Germans said, hey, listen, we got a deal for you. Uh, let's uh, get a, an alliance together, you and us, Germany and Mexico, and uh, that's only if the United States goes to war. And you know what? If you agree to this, we, the Germans, we can get all that land back for you that you lost after the War of 1848. Uh, again, Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, Nevada, pieces of California, including Los Angeles, San Francisco, San Diego, all these big cities today. But the Mexicans declined. Uh, breaking diplomatic ties with Germany. February 3rd, Wilson severed the diplomatic relations with Germany, and that moves a step or America a step closer to World War I. Wilson acted after Theobald von Bethlehem Hallweg. The German Chancellor declared that Germany would resume unlimited submarine warfare on January 31st. Wilson said, uh, we do not desire any hostile conflict with the German government. However, however, if Germany followed through with its threat to sink American ships without warning, it would find itself at war with the United States. Wilson gets that telegram on February 24th, the Zimmerman telegram. But he waits until March 30th. The reason why he waits until March, uh, rather March 20th. He waits until then, he has a cabinet meeting, and he lays it all on the table. They are ready to hit our ships again, killing American passengers. What are we going to do? Well, break diplomatic ties with Germany. Break with Germany. After the sinking of five U.S. vessels, something had to be done. On April 6, 1970, Congress voted to declare war on Germany. Wilson had asked Congress for a war to end all wars that would make the world safe for democracy. And here's the draft. The draft is implemented in 1917, and Wilson's pulling the numbers up. And of course, if you have one of the numbers he pulls up real fast, you're going to war. On May 18th, Congress passed the Selective Service Act which authorized the federal government to temporarily expand the military through conscription. The act eventually required all men between the ages of 21 and 45 to register for military service. Under the act, 24 million men registered for the draft. Of the, of the total U.S. troops sent to Europe, 2.85 million men came were drafted and another 2 million enlisted. 
The first American troops arrived in Europe in June. Troops didn't fully participate at the front until October, when the first division, one of the best trained divisions of the American military, entered the trenches at Nancy, France. The Doughboy. You may be recalled the Doughboy. None of you are old enough to know who the Doughboy was. But you know who the Pillsbury Doughboy is, right? No? Yes. You never made any cakes? Yeah. Pillsbury. Anyway, the Doughboy. The Doughboy is the American GI. Uh, it was a popular nickname for the American infantrymen during World War I. The Great War marked the first time in history that the United States sent soldiers abroad to defend foreign soil. The French said, great, yes. Go back a minute. You said they sunk four five, ships. Five. Five American ships? Yes. Yes. Five American ships. Actual American, not Actually, just ships. Well, American, yeah, American ships, also with American passengers on mm -hmm. So, anyway, the French said, Viva la America! They're here. They've come over there. Uh, there were some important people who were drafted and served, including this guy. The mayor of the city of New York, 1914 to 1918, born July 19th, 1879, died in the service of the United States July 6th, 1918, and he was only, at this point, 38 years old, in memory uh, of John Kurai Michael, the mayor of New York City. Can you imagine? He is serving. He is serving the mayor of New York City, which was the biggest city in the country at that point. He's called um, up, he goes over, and he gets killed. He's 30 uh, something years old. Yeah, he's 38 years old or so at that point. Yeah, 1919, yeah, he's 38 years old. Um, Yanks, Sammies, Persians Crusaders, they were some of the names that uh, were used to label American enlisted men in World War I. Persians Crusaders, Sammies. Uncle Sam's troops, that made some appearances in advertising and propaganda posters. Labels weren't well liked by the troops, many of whom preferred to be called Yanks. That's what they wanted to be called, Yanks. Uh, more than four million men, along with support from non-military personnel, were needed for the war by November 17th. The Americans were on the battlefield. Many of you remember this song over there. Over there, over there, over there, and we won't come back till it's over, over there. George M. Cohan wrote the song, Over There, probably the greatest propaganda song ever in the United States, and when you consider all the wars, the Revolutionary War, War of 1812, Mexican-American War, uh, Civil War, and then you had uh, the War of uh, 1898, and this one, and this song still sort of resonates a bit. George M. Cohan wrote over there after he learned that the U.S. abandoned the policy of non-intervention and planned to enter World War I on the side of the Allied powers. Over there was the greatest of wartime propaganda songs, and it was made famous, let me see if anybody knows who Nora Bays is. Nora Bays. During her day, Nora Bates, during her day, she was very popular on the vaudeville stage. She introduced some songs as well back in the days. Hey, 1908. You've probably heard of this song uh, written by her boyfriend, who wasn't her boyfriend at the time, Jack Norworth. Uh, Take Me Out to the Ball Game? Yes. Yeah, you've heard of that one? Yes. Then she wrote a song with uh, her then husband, Jack Norworth called Shine On Harvest Moon. Yeah. You've heard that one too? Yeah. And she made George M. Cohan's song famous over there. By the way, of the three songs that she made famous over there, Shine On Harvest Moon, or Take Me Out to the Ball Game in 2024, which is the most popular? Take Me, Take me Out to the Ball Game. Take Me Out to the Ball Game. Does anybody remember Shine On Harvest Moon under the age of uh, 65? Probably not. Probably not. Uh, oh, how I hate to get up in the morning. Um, Irving Berlin. Ever hear of Irving Berlin? Yeah, sure. You know, he couldn't read music, Irving Berlin. Couldn't read music at all. Oh, how I hate to get up in the morning. Over there, Don't Send My Darling Boy Away, two popular songs. There was an anti-German, Bing Bang, Bingham on the Rhine. 
Other songs depicted the everyday lives of soldiers, such as uh, Berlin's Oh, How I Hate to Get Up in the Morning, I Don't Want to Get Well, a duet by Arthur Fields and Grace Woods. Uh, and there was also a song for African Americans. It was called The Colored Soldier Boys of Uncle Sam We're Coming. Words and music by W.J. Nickerson, dedicated to the colored soldiers of the United States. Uh, and it came out of New Orleans. Now, the United States military at that point was segregated. So they really did not serve with the Americans in World War I, but they did serve. African Americans participated in every military conflict since the inception of the United States, enlisted and prepared for involvement. However, many of those who enlisted or were drafted found themselves in non-combative support roles. Many African Americans served under the services of supply section of the American Expeditionary Forces. Uh, this section was composed of stevedore, labor, and engineer service bat battalions and companies. The main function of these companies was to support and provide materials to other companies along the front. But these, some guys would see action. Uh, they were in the 92nd and 93rd Infantry Divisions. The 369th Colored Soldiers Infantry Regiment, also known as the Harlem Hellfighters, were assigned to the French Army in April. In this post, the Hellfighters saw much action, uh, fighting in the Second Battle of the Marne, as well as the Meuse Argonne Offensive. For his valiant and brave actions during World War I, Private Henry Johnson of the 369 became the first American ever to receive a war cross from France. 170 other members of uh, the uh, 369th also got war cross medals. Sports takes a back seat. Sports wasn't important. U.S. government said we're at war. It's non-essential, totally non-essential. This guy is Hank Gowdy. He's a catcher with the Boston Nationals or the Boston Braves. And uh, he becomes the first uh, Major League Baseball player to enlist in World War I. Uh, most professional sports teams shut down due to World War I. There wasn't really all that much professionalism. There was some boxing here and there, uh, probably some tennis tournaments or some other stuff. But baseball was the sport. That was it. Uh, you had the hockey, but that was up in Canada. And you had some basically semi-pro football teams here and there, mostly in Ohio and Pennsylvania. But baseball was the big one, and like I said, boxing. Uh, public opinion turned against athletes who chose to stay in the United States and play ball rather than join their fellow countrymen in combat. One of those people who did not serve was Jack Dempsey, who ultimately became the heavyweight champion of the world in boxing. And he was labeled as a draft dodger because he did not serve. As he said, he was the sole uh, provider for his family, and if you were the sole provider, you didn't go necessarily into the army. That made him controversial. Uh, and he sort of was like the Muhammad Ali of his days in the way. You know, Ali was also declared, or, or also thought to be a draft dodger. And people would come up and watch, or come out to watch Dempsey, hoping that he'd have his head handed to him because he didn't serve in World War I. Uh, the Army General Enoch Crowder convinced Newton Baker, the U.S. Secretary of War, that any draft eligible men employed in not essential jobs should be forced to choose, enlist to help stateside, or risk going to the front lines of Europe. Woodrow Wilson decided he was going to trample on the U.S. Constitution. Freedom of speech. Freedom of speech. He is going to take the right of freedom of speech away from those who opposed U.S. entry into World War I. Uh, the Espionage Act was passed by Congress on June 15. It was an outgrowth of the federal government's efforts during World War I to contain not only espionage, but also public criticism of its war efforts. The Espionage Act cracked down on wartime activities considered dangerous or disloyal, including attempts to acquire defense-related information with the intent to harm the United States or acquire code and signal books, photographs, blueprints, and other such documents with the intentions of passing it on to America's enemies. 
Uh, the Espionage Act was uh, based on the Defense Secrets Act of 1911, especially the notions of obtaining or delivering information related to national defense to a person who is not entitled to have it. The Espionage Law uh, imposed much stiffer penalties than the 1911 law, which was signed into law by President William Howard Taft. Don't talk. This web is spun for you with invisible threads. Keep out of it. Help to destroy it. Stop. Think. Ask yourself, if you were about to say, why help the enemy? Spies are listening. The outlaw, or rather the act, outlawed false statements intended to interfere with military operations and attempts to incite insubordination or obstruct the recruitment of troops, and false statements promoting the success of America's enemies. Those charged with the violations were, uh, or the, with violations, were subject to a $10,000 fine, which would be $264,000 today, uh, and 20 years in prison. If it happened during wartime, you got 30 years in prison. How many of you heard of Emma Goodman? Uh, Emma Goldman, rather. No. No? She was the one that wrote the song. Yeah. Yeah. No, you think of Emma Lazarus. Oh. Nobody in here has heard of Emma Goldman? She was an anarchist. She was a socialist. She was a communist. She was arrested in 1915 and 1916 for talking about birth control in public. Uh, during World War I, Goldman actively protested the war and encouraged men not to register for the draft. Arrested on June 15th, uh, she was prosecuted and convicted for conspiring against the draft. Uh, under the Espionage Act. She was an anarchist, political activist, a writer renowned for her uh, vehement advocacy for free speech, women's rights, social reform. In the late 19th century and early 20th century, this time she was sentenced to two years in prison. The year before, in 1916, she was arrested in New York City for talking publicly about birth control. She was offered pay a $100 fine or go to jail for two weeks. She chose to go to jail because she thought birth control, and she was not an advocate of abortion. She was an advocate of birth control. But uh, she was sent to jail because she talked about birth control. Uh, look at this poster. Looks like uh, King Kong and Fay Ray, doesn't it? Uh, destroy this mad brute. Uh, enlist, and that was a recruitment for men to join the U.S. Army. The Committee on Public Information was created by Wilson to promote patriotism. Wilson established the committee in April through Executive Order 2594 in response to the entry into World War I in an attempt to mobilize public opinion behind the war effort with every available form of mass communication. Those days, newspapers, magazines, and silent movies. That was it. Uh, there was kind of radio, but there wasn't. Uh, television wouldn't come about until 1921, so it was newspapers, magazines, posters here and there, and uh, of course, uh, w movies that were made. Uh, visual images helped to mobilize support for the war. The division of pictorial publicity joined with the division of advertising to create some of the war's most vivid images and posters designed to demonize the German military. Some of the most infamous posters portrayed a German guerrilla with a club labeled Kultar and a green-eyed, blue-skinned German soldier with bloody fingers. The movies, 1917, it's Mary Pickford. Anybody here remember Mary Pickford? Yes. Yes. She was America's sweetheart, wasn't she? Right, she was. Except she came from the British Northern Territories. <laughs> she wasn't an American. Uh, but anyway, she lived in California. Through the Committee on Public Information, Woodrow Wilson speechwriter George Creel deployed the Four Minute Men into neighborhood movie theaters in order to spread pro war propaganda. American producers began to bank on wartime propaganda as the U.S. moved away from neutrality and toward putting boots on European battlegrounds. Mary Pickford uh, played a plucky heroine who survived a German U-boat attack in the Cecil B. DeMille-directed Little American 
By the way, anybody here who's ever watched the Charlton Heston movie, Ten Commandments? Yes. yes. Do you know who the narrator of that film is? None other than Cecil B. Yes. Cecil B. DeMille. Yeah. Um, anyway, she was from British North America or Canada. And she went on tour with Douglas Fairbanks, who was an American, and Charles Chaplin of England. They were selling United States Liberty Bonds. Wilson's Against Women's Suffrage. Uh, well, uh, welcome suffrage envoys. And in 1917, it gets really, really nasty in the streets for some women. Alice Paul. Anybody here ever hear of Alice Paul? No? There is an Alice Paul Museum in New Jersey. And, uh, well, I will tell you the story of Alice Paul because she's an interesting person who you should probably know a little bit about. She leads the fight to get women the right to vote in the United States. But it's a fight that lands her in jail because politicians don't think that women should vote. Alice Paul was born in 1885, brought up in New Jersey, and she was a Quaker. And the Quaker values are based on equality, racial, and gender equality. She pursued an unusually high level of education for a woman of her time, graduating Swarthmore College in 1905. She received a master's in sociology in 1907 and a PhD in economics from an Ivy League school, Penn. Uh, she went to England uh, shortly after she graduated uh, college to study social justice. It was there she ran into Emmeline and uh, Christabel Pankhurst, uh, who were leading the movement in the United Kingdom to win voting rights for women. Alice Paul decided to join the Pankhurst movement in the UK for the vote, and she learned everything that she possibly could from their social change and brought it back to America somewhere around 1910. And there is Alice Paul. She realized that being polite and asking sweetly for the right to vote was not getting women anywhere, and that radical tactics were necessary. For a woman, that might mean standing on the street corner, holding a sign, or speaking out from a stage. Those were radical acts for women back around that time, because women were supposedly going to obey everything their husband said. Women were not to have any voice. Uh, while in prison in England, she learned that hunger strikes were an effective way to get attention and to bring sympathy to the cause. She returned to the United States in 1910, turned her attention to the American suffrage movement after the deaths of Elizabeth Cady Stanton in 1902 and Susan B. Anthony in 1906. The suffrage movement was languishing, lacking focus on the conservative suffragette organizations that concentrate, concentrate only on getting state suffrage. Uh, she believed that the movement needed to focus on the passage of a federal women's voters' right amendment to the U.S. Constitution. 1911, she led Philadelphia's first street corner campaign for the right to vote. Night after night, for two months, speaking from a horse-drawn cart, Paul and other suffragettes uh, made their case to crowds that sometimes numbered in the 100s. At her side was a woman named Lucy Burns from Brooklyn. She met her in London. She went over to also get involved in the women's uh, movement to get the vote in the UK. There is Lucy Burns. Uh, Paul and Burns offered to take over the National Women's Suffrage Association's <coughs> Congressional Committee in Washington, D.C. That was the group that was supposed to get the Congressional Amendment. She topped her action with a plan for a parade, a spectacle that, of a sort that was never seen before in Washington. That is the program. Uh, official program, Woman Suffrage Procession, Washington, D.C., March 3, 1913, which happened to be the night before Woodrow Wilson was inaugurated as President of the United States. There were 8,000 women in Washington. Female marchers, wearing white or clad in colorful caps and capes, interspersed with mounted brigades, decorated floats, and those floats were all unspooled on Pennsylvania Avenue. The first float proclaimed, we demand an amendment to the Constitution of the United States in franchising the women of the country. Demand. Women never use that word. Women weren't supposed to make demands. 
right? Right? No. No, they weren't at that time. A lot of women themselves didn't want the vote. Yes, I know. Yes, I know. Uh, and they were putting an unsympathetic Wilson on notice. They expected action. No sooner was Paul's parade underway when thousands of onlookers spilled onto the path, blocking its progress. Men spit at the women. They threw lighted cigarettes at the women, hurled insults. And the police, and their job there is to make sure there's law and order, they turn the other way. The women are on their own. Surprised many, though, Paul was pleased with the chaos. The parade made news from coast to coast. Uh, there would be other things going on in 1914. The Senate said no to a congressional amendment uh, for women's voting. In 1915, the House said no. Uh, 1915, Den the women in Denmark and Iceland got the right to vote. Uh, it's 1917, and there are more protests. Mr. President, how long must women wait for liberty? Mr. President, what will you do for women's suffrage? Uh, these were the silent sentinels, and they were in front of the White House day after day after day after day. By 1917, with little progress to show, a fresh approach gained traction. On January 10th, Paul led 12 women to the White House gates, bearing huge banners that challenge Wilson. How long must women wait for liberty? What will you do for women's suffrage? The women called themselves silent sentinels because they did not speak a word. And the New York Times, the very liberal, right? They're the liberal media, the New York Times, right? That's what their label is. The New York Times labeled the women silent, silly, and offensive because they wanted the right to vote. They were silent, silly, and offensive. Let me ask you a question. Were they silent, silly, and offensive in your mind? They wanted to the vote. Day after day, the women reported for duty through rain, through snow. Wilson throws them something that he does not intend to do. Uh, he gave the silent senators new ammunition with a speech to Congress seeking a declaration for war. He said, we shall fight for the things which we've always carried nearest to our hearts, for democracy, for the right of those who submit to authority to have a voice in their own government. All of a sudden, Woodrow Wilson hands them a statement on a silver platter. Protests and arrests. Well, women are trying to get the vote, and they're getting beaten up. Uh, the protests immediately seized, or the demonstrators immediately seized on Wilson's words. Uh, new banners ask how America could claim democracy when 20 million women can't vote. The president was scorned as Kaiser Wilson. The scene at the White House gates turned ugly. Counter protesters, fired by patriotic zeal, uh, called the women traitors. They seized their banners, they shredded them, sometimes injuring the women in the process. This is Virginia Arnold, and she's standing in front of uh, the sign. Kaiser Wilson, have you forgotten your sympathy with the poor Germans because they were not self-governed? Uh, 20 million American women are not, are not self-governed. Uh, take the beam out of your eye. Virginia Arnold, one of the protesters. Women carrying banners were attacked. Uh, by enraged soldiers and sailors who were in town. The pickets were arrested, spent days and weeks in jail on trumped-up charges of obstructing traffic. Paul drew a sentence of seven months. Denied status as a political prisoner, she began a hunger strike. Others followed suit, prompting authorities to begin force feeding. That is Lucy Burns in jail. She's thrown in jail as well. On November 14, 31 pickets were dispatched to a Virginia workhouse, hurled into cold cells, plagued with rats and flies, forced into hard labor, fed a starvation diet. Eventually, news of their mistreatment leaked to the papers. Between the news of the women's prisoners being mistreated and a New York and New York voters approving in 1917, November 1917, suffrage for women. Congress called on Wilson 
drop your opposition. It's all over. That's what Congress thought. Silent protest parade. Fifth Avenue. They're protesting lynching in the United States. They're protesting people burnt at the stake in the United States. This is 1970. July 28th, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People's Silent Protest Parade, also known as the Silent March, took place on Fifth Avenue in Manhattan. The protest was a response to violence against African Americans, including race riots, lynching, and outrages in Texas, and Tennessee, Illinois, and other states. But they are responding to one specific instance, the East St. Louis, Illinois race riot, also called the East St. Louis Massacre, starts on July 2nd, major catalyst of the silent parade. This horrific event drove close to 6,000 blacks from their own burning homes and left several hundred dead. The revival of the Klan, thanks to Woodrow Wilson. Thanks a lot to Woodrow Wilson. Uh, in February 1915, upon viewing the movie, The Birth of a Nation and a Special White House Screaming, President Woodrow Wilson reportedly remarked, it's like writing history with lightning. My only regret is that it is all so terribly true. Wilson believed in the lost cause. And on April 11, 1913, he segregated the post office, which was the home to over 60% of the federal jobs at the time, and employed many black workers. Uh, this is Stone Mountain, Georgia. Anybody been down to Stone Mountain, Georgia? Yes, sir. You have been. It's a little north of Atlanta. It's a mountain. Stone Mountain, Georgia is a minority majority town today. So if you go down to Stone Mountain, you see mostly African Americans uh, in the park. It's a nice park. But you come to this little area that is a Confederate monument, literally a monument to the Confederacy, and carved into the mountain, Jefferson Davis and Stonewall Jackson and uh, Robert E. Lee. Uh, there have been some proposals on the other side of the mountain, have some famous people from Georgia there as well, like the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King and John uh, Lewis, the congressman. Um, so that is the, uh, what's been carved into the mountain. The popularity of D.W. Griffith's film, Birth of a Nation, and it's specifically, it's showing in Atlanta, uh, provided the major impetus for the emergence of the Klan. Inspired by Birth of the Nation, the Alabama-born William J. Simmons held a uh, ceremony atop the Stone Mountain on November 25, 1915, to announce the refounding of the uh, Ku Klux Klan. The venerable family who owned the mountain allowed Simmons and his version of the Klan uh, to use the mountain for rituals. And this would also lead into immigration uh, all of a sudden. In 1916, Congress, hosted by white supremacy, decided, hey, you know what? We need to kick the immigrants out of the country or not allow them into the country, but only certain immigrants. Statue of Liberty says, don't come. Uh, on February 5th, the Immigration Act of 1917 was passed by the 64th United States Congress with an overwhelming majority overriding Woodrow Wilson's December 14th, 1916 veto. Immigration Act required a literacy test for immigrants and barred Asian laborers, except those who came from countries with special treaties or agreements with the United States such as the Philippines, which was a United States territory at the time. This is what the Immigration Act said. The Act added to and consolidated the list of undesirables banned from entering the country. These would include alcoholics, anarchists, contract laborers, criminals, convicts, epileptics, feeble-minded persons, idiots, illiterates, imbeciles, insane persons, paupers, persons afflicted with contagious disease, persons being mentally or physically defective, persons with constitutional uh, uh, psychopathic inferiority, political radicals, polygamists, prostitutes, and vagrants. I think the only one that they didn't have up there was a moron. I think they got everybody else. What do you think? Now, my grandfather came into the country, both my grandfathers came into the country before this. 
I'm Jewish. And they had a problem keeping the Jews out because the Jews had to learn Torah. And they would ask them simple words. And the simple words would all be in the Torah. So they couldn't kick out the kind of people that they wanted to kick out, which was uh, the Italians from uh, Eastern Europe, along with the Jews and other undesirables. Uh, but that was uh, 1917. And by 1924, they would uh, complete what they wanted to do. The Immigration Act of 1917, I was born on the Lower East Side of uh, Manhattan. And I, was, uh, I lived on Eldridge Street. And my father had a uh, television repair shop on Hester Street. So I knew what was going on back in those days because you know, my family was from the Lower East Side. And my grandmother, who became a district leader for the Democratic Committee, uh, the Lower East Side, and my aunt, who eventually became uh, Bella Abzug's chief of staff, my, they would talk about what they knew from those days. And uh, so I knew a lot about what was going on in terms of Jews coming in, but not of uh, other people. Uh, the Immigration Act, uh, this uh, affected uh, European immigration uh, with the provision barring all immigrants uh, over the age of 16 who were illiterate. Literacy was defined as the ability to read 30 or 40 words of their own language from ordinary texts, whether it was, in my case, Yiddish or Hebrew, they could do that. Uh, but those the, they wanted to keep out people who did not, uh, who didn't know 40 words or so. Puerto Ricans became American citizens. 1898, Spain ceded the island of Puerto Rico and the Philippines to the United States as a result of its defeat in the Spanish-American War under the terms of the Treaty of 1898. Wilson signed the Jones uh, Shefforth Act on March 2nd, giving Puerto Ricans U.S. citizenship. Puerto Ricans would receive American benefits, but would not be allowed to vote in the presidential election and would not have representation in Congress. But Puerto Ricans could join the uh, United States military. American Virgin Islands, I'm imitating an iguana. Anybody been to the Virgin Islands? Iguanas hang out in trees like that. So I decided I want to be like an iguana. Uh, the United States began to take an interest in the Danish West Indies in the 19th century. In 1867, a treaty to sell St. Thomas and St. John to the United States uh, was agreed upon, but the deal fell through. Second draft treaty to sell the islands to the United States, negotiated in 1902, was defeated in the upper house of the Danish parliament in a tie vote because the opposition carried a 97-year-old life member into the chamber, and he voted against it. Uh, American Virgin Islands, with the palm trees and the trade winds and the heat. Uh, the onset of World War I, 1914, brought the Danish economy and reforms on the island to a close. The islands were isolated and exposed during the submarine phases of the war in the United States, fearing the islands might be seriously seized, or might be seized by the uh, Germans, as the submarine base approached Denmark about buying them, after a few months of negotiations, the U.S. sent $25 million, or $661 million in today's money in gold coins, to Denmark in exchange for the islands. The deal was finalized January 17th, when the United States and Denmark exchanged their respective treaty ramifications. The United States took possession of the islands on March 31st, it was renamed the Virgin Islands of the United States. Prohibition is another big issue back in 1917. That's Carrie Nation. She carried a hatchet around and broke up saloons. Um, in 1826, the first of the temperance societies, American Temperance Society, formed. Uh, while it had some success, it wasn't until after the proliferation of the Civil War that the temperance movement uh, gained some traction. Uh, these are a bunch of women and they are standing outside of the saloon. They want to go in the saloon, but they're not allowed in the saloon. And they want to pull their husbands out, but they can't do it. So they're protesting, and they had good reason to protest. In 1873, the Women's Christian Temperance Union was founded, and temperance uh, movement got its most forceful voice. The history of the temperance movement and the women's movement are often linked which is why the WCTU originally proposed the ban of alcohol 
as a method of preventing abuse from alcoholic husbands who came in and beat them up. And they had no recourse. They had to take the beatings. Uh, the WCTU spent many years building the movement through education and local state laws. 1881, they had big success. Kansas uh, included a ban on alcohol in its state constitution. Want to mess with her? Want to mess with her? No. And her hatchet? Uh, it's at this time, Harry Nation came to prominence by attacking saloons with a hatchet. However, saloons still maintain their popularity, though that popularity was on the decline during the Progressive Era, which started in 1890, when the hostility towards saloons became widespread. The push for prohibition gained momentum, with, often with women in Protestant congregations leading the way, and also the KKK was involved. Why were they involved? Because they thought that it would be against Catholics. Close the saloons. If you believe that traffic in alcohol does more harm than good, help stop it. Strengthen the American campaign. That came out of 22nd Street in Manhattan. During World War I, there was a temporary prohibition on alcohol production. It was also a uh, pronounced anti-German sentiment pushed by the Anti-Saloon League. And since many brewers were German and often uh, the loudest opponents of prohibition, this temporary solution dealt a serious blow to the anti-prohibition forces. The support for a ban on alcohol continued. This is the proposal that went through Congress, passed by Congress, and would be sent to the people. December 18th, a constitutional amendment to prohibit alcohol was proposed in the Senate, and it would be acted upon the next year. Vote dry. These people are saying, vote dry. The prohibition movement wanted to rid American society of the tyranny of the drink. But farmers that grew fruit could retain the ability to produce hard cider and whiskey and wine and would be available for medicinal and religious purposes. The Russian Revolution. Vladimir Lenin is behind me. This is a subway station in St. Petersburg, Russia. The Russian Revolution. There were actually two. Uh, the Russian Revolution was one of the most explosive political events in the 20th century. The violent revolution marked the end of the Romanov dynasty and centuries of Russian imperial rule. Economic hardship, food shortages, and government corruption all contributed to the dissolution uh, with Tsar Nicholas II. Time to say goodbye to the Tsar. Uh, increasing governmental corruption, the reactionary policies of the Tsar, Nicholas II, and catastrophic Russian losses in World War I contributed to the widespread dissatisfaction and economic hardship. Most Russians uh, had completely lost faith in Nicholas II. In February, riots over food scarcity broke out in Petrograd, today St. Petersburg. The rebels joined the uh, the uh, people who were against the Tsar. Uh, the first <coughs> Russian Revolution was in Petrograd. That building was in uh, Petrograd then, and it's in St. Petersburg now. It's a church. On March 11th, the troops of Petrograd's army garrison were called out to quell the uprising. In some encounters, the uh, regiments opened fire, killed demonstrators, but the protest kept to the streets. Troop began to waver. Uh, the Duma formed a provisional government on March 12th. A few days later, the Tsar is God, advocates the throne, and that's the end of uh, Russian, uh, uh, of the Romanov rule. 1917. Between March and October, the provisional government was recognized four times. Alexander Kerensky became its leader in July. He survived a coup attempt by uh, Larva uh, Kornilov, but was unable to halt Russia's slide into political and military chaos. By September, the Bolsheviks, led by Vladimir Lenin, achieved majorities in the Petrograd and Moscow Soviets, won increasing support among the hungry urban workers and soldiers. The second revolution would be in the fall, and this is the one that uh, sets up today's, or the, the old Soviet Union. Early October, the Bolsheviks staged a nearly bloodless coup, occupying government buildings and strategic posts. Kerensky tried unsuccessfully to organize resistance. He fled the country. The Congress of Soviets approved the formation of a new government composed mainly of Bolsheviks. 
The Winter Palace is storm. That is the Winter Palace in St. Petersburg. It's October 24th and 25th, 1917. The Bolsheviks, the left-wing socialists, force, uh, forces under Vladimir Lenin seize key government buildings, storm the Winter Palace, then the seat of the new government in Russia's capital, Petrograd. The Bolshevik Revolution was also referred to as the Great October Socialist Revolution, first successful. Marxist school in history, the ineffectual provisional government was dislodged and it was replaced with the Soviet Socialist Republic under Lenin's leadership on November 7th. A Russian uh, civil war would follow, hammer and sickle again in St. Petersburg, uh, and uh, the warring factions included the Red and White Armies. The Red Army fought for Lenin's Bolshevik government. The White Army represented a large group of loosely allied forces, monarchists, capitalists, and supporters of democratic socialism. So uh, the Balfour or Balfour Declaration. So you're the only one who knows about it, right? Anybody else know about the Balfour Declaration? It's still being fought as we're talking today. Still has an impact 107 years later. Uh, Arthur James Balfour was a career politician in England. Started his career in 1874. He became the first Lord of the Admiralty in the wartime coalition and the foreign secretary. On November 2nd, the Balfour Declaration was released. It was a statement of British support. Didn't say do it. Didn't say do it. Statement of British support for the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people. It was made in a letter from Arthur James Balfour to Lionel Walter Rothschild, second Baron Rothschild of Trent, the leader of the Anglo-Jewish community. Uh, and there's Chaim Weitzman. Did you hear of Chaim Weitzman? Yes. Yeah, Father of Zionism. Well, uh, the Balfour Declaration issued through the uh, continued efforts of Chaim Weitzman and Nahum Sokolov, uh, the Zionist leaders in London, fell short of expectations of the Zionists who had asked for a reconstruction of Palestine as the Jewish national home. Those were Jewish settlers in Palestine at that point, and there weren't very many. They were outnumbered about 9 or 10 to 1 at that point. Uh, the Declaration specifically stipulated that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine. The document, however, said nothing of the political or national rights of these communities and did not refer to them by name. Nevertheless, the Declaration aroused enthusiastic hopes among Zionists and seemed to fulfill the aims of the World Zionist Organization. The British government hoped that the Declaration would rally Jewish opinion, especially in the United States, to the side of the Allied powers against the Central Powers in World War I. There were Jews who fought for the Central Powers. They hoped also that the settlement in Palestine of a pro-British Jewish population might help to protect the approaches to the Suez Canal in neighboring Egypt and thus ensure a vital communication route to the British Crown possession in India. Now, do you know what was the largest man-made explosion in the world until the atomic bomb was dropped? No. Halifax, Nova Scotia, December 6th. And I was up in Halifax, spoke on cruise ships. In fact, one day, no return address, nothing. I got a book from somebody, got my address, about this, the Halifax explosion. And you've never heard of the Halifax explosion, have you? It was the largest man-made explosion ever, certainly of its time, until 1945. On December 6, a munitions, uh, French munitions ship uh, collided with a steamer. The Mount Blanc blew up with more than 2,000 casualties in leveling a part of Halifax. Boston sent aid. Uh, this is the explosion and what it looked like on December 6. 1970. Of the 1,600 people, over 1,600 people were killed instantly, 9,000 were injured, 300 of whom died later. 
every building within the 2.6 kilometer or 1.6 mile radius, over 12,000 in total, was badly destroyed or damaged. Uh, that is the monument to the people who died uh, in 1917. And this is from 2017 as they were cleaning up the place in anticipation for the ceremonies on December the 6th. Hundreds of people who had been watching the fire from their homes were blinded. They were blinded uh, when the blast shattered windows in front of them. Uh, and this is the neighborhood today, and all of this stuff has been uh, rebuilt, and uh, its structures have been strengthened just in case something else ever blows up in the Halifax Harbor. An extensive, uh, uh, an extensive uh, comparing of 130 uh, major explosions by Halifax historian Jay White in 1994 concluded that the Halifax Harbor remains unchallenged in overall magnitude as long as five criteria are considered together. Number of casualties, force of the blast, radius of devastation, quantity of explosive material, total value of the property destroyed. Seattle won the Stanley Cup. Any hockey fans in here? Did not. Seattle was the first American team ever to win the Stanley Cup. Uh, from 1893 to 1914, the Stanley Cup was a challenge trophy. Uh, the champions held on to the cup until they lost the league title to another club or a champion from another league issued a formal challenge and subsequently defeated them in a special game or series. And the National Hockey League starts, there I am, 30 years ago. Uh, the National Hockey League was organized on November 26th in Montreal following the suspension of operations by the National Hockey Association of Canada Limited. Montreal Canadiens, Montreal Wanderers, Ottawa Senators, Quebec Bulldogs attended the founding meeting. The Toronto Arenas were admitted as a fifth team, but Quebec City decided they weren't going to play, left four teams, and the season opened on December 19. So what's the 1917 legacy that we've been living with and that has impacted all of your lives? The Allies defeated the Central Powers, led by Germany, November 11, 1918. The war was over, but the peace was elusive. Wilson proposed the League of Nations to settle international disputes. The body was formed, but America never joined. America did not sign either the Treaty of Versailles in 1919 or the Treaty of Lausanne in 1923. That ends World War I. German leaders claim that they did not lose on the battlefield, but were stabbed in the back by Jews and others. An Australian soldier who fought for the Germans bought into this myth, his name, Adolf Hitler. The United States still has the Espionage Act, amended many times. On June 8, 2023, Donald Trump was indicted on 31 counts of willfully retention of national defense information and further six counts relating to obstruction, conspiracy, and concealing documents in a federal investigation as part of the Espionage Act which is now 107 years old. Uh, Carrie Nation, Boston's original speakeasy, is a bar right down the street from the State House in Boston. Prohibition and most women got the vote uh, thanks to constitutional amendments in 1920, Prohibition got in 1933. Not all women got the right to vote in 1920. Native Americans were not allowed to, uh, were not allowed in United States citizenship, so the federal amendment did not give them the right to vote. With the passage of the Snyder Act in 1924, native-born women gained citizenship. As late as 1962, individual states still prevented some women from voting by the use of literacy tax, poll taxes, and claims that uh, residents of a reservation meant that you were not a resident of that state. Native-born Asian Americans already had uh, U.S. citizenship in 1920. First-generation Asian Americans did not. Asian American immigrant women were therefore excluded from voting until the Immigration and Nationality Act of 1952. They got citizenship three decades after the 19th Amendment. The shame of America. Do you know that the United States is the only land on Earth where human beings are burnt at the stake? You know that? Yeah. That was true in the 19th century. In four years, 1918, 1921, 28 people were publicly burned by American mobs. 
3,336 people lynched, 1889 to 1922. 1922, lynching became a federal hate crime after a century of blocked efforts. Uh, the Emmett Till Anti-Lynching Act is a United States federal law which defined lynching as a federal hate crime, increasing the maximum penalty to 30 years imprisonment for several hate crime offenses. The uh, America, this is the New York Times, 1924. America of the melting pot comes to an end. Congress passed two immigration laws, 1921, 1924, which created uh, quotas for immigration and kept Eastern Europeans and Asians out of America. It also created a term that you probably have heard, undocumented, uh, in 1924. Puerto Rican residents are seeking United States statehood, while Virgin Islanders, uh, they seem to be satisfied with being in United States territory. Uh, that is uh, Russia. Lenin would ultimately prevail in Russia, the Soviet Union would ally with America and Britain during World War II and defeated Nazi Germany. But the United States and the Soviet Union relations worsened uh, following the Japanese surrender on September 2nd, 1945, which ended the fighting uh, World War II and the Cold War ensued. Soviet Union collapsed on December 26, 1991. The Halifax Harbor explosion became the second largest man-made explosion in history after the United States dropped an atomic bomb on Hiroshima, Japan, August 6, 1945. Nova Scotia sends a Christmas tree annually to Boston as thanks. And we live in the Middle East. Uh, and that is from last October. The Middle East remains a major global problem. England left the Middle East by 1948. Uh, when Israel became a nation. The state of Israel seemingly has been at war with Arab nations since its inception. The latest war was caused by Hamas, terrorist attack uh, on October 7th, 2023. Uh, there have been numerous revolts and uprisings since then. Any questions, any comments? That was the world of 1917, and that is the world you inherited and that is, in a way, the world that is...